happy to welcome you to another one of my history and government discussions. I do these from time to time on a variety of topics, and I do them to try to help people to learn more about our wonderful nation and the incredible system of government that emanates from the unique constitution that we operate under. I hope you enjoy this presentation, uh, and please come back and watch some more when you have an opportunity. I do post them to YouTube once they are completed, and I've had a chance to edit them in a minor way at least. So I hope that you will be able to join us uh, very often. And so here, let's get underway for today. The topic today uh, is uh, to deal with something going back into the 19th century. We're going to deal with a period that is called the Gilded Age. The reason I picked this this time is it just strikes me that we have some financial um, assets uh, that are completely out of whack in our society. I thought it'd be good to go back and look at a time that was both glamorous, obscene, ostentatious, and inhumane all at the same time. A time of great contrasts. So the, the Gilded Age is basically uh, 1865 to 1900, uh, more like 1870 to then 1890s, but whatever you want to pick as a year isn't important. We had people like this. This is Andrew Carnegie, who was very, very rich. And this is Boss Tweed, and he was very powerful and very crooked at the same time. The term, the Gilded Age, comes from our friend Mark Twain. Uh, Mark Twain uh, called it a period of gross materialism, blatant political corruption. And in the 1870s, it gave rise, rise to important novels of social and political criticism. The period takes its name from the earliest of these, the Gilded Age, written in 1873 by Twain and a partner. The novel gives a vivid and accurate description of Washington, D.C. and its people with caricatures of many leading figures of the day, including greedy industrialists and corrupt politicians. And of course, we only had them in the 1890s and 1880s, right? This is what guilt looks like. Now, guilt and guild, uh, words depending upon how you're using them is what we're talking about. When you're, when you're really dealing with something that is a base metal underneath, but on the surface, it is bright, shiny gold. And these are a couple of examples of guilt. Yes, and even Oscar is guilt. That is gold on top of base metal. And I suppose I should have done my homework and figured out what the base metal is, but um, it's, that's how it comes up. Now, the guilts that I knew when I was growing up were these. So what is that? A gilt pig is a female under the age of one year, generally a pig who has not farrowed or given birth to a litter. Once a pig has had a litter and passed her first year, she's called a sow. When I grew up, that's how we use the word gilt. Gilded age, post-reconstruction America. Praised by Mark Twain. Think of a beautiful, shiny red apple that's rotten on the inside. That's what the Gilded Age was. Brassy, flamboyant age. The period between the end of the Radical Reconstruction, 1877, the beginning of the Progressive Era, brassy, flamboyant age dominated by big business values, political corruption, and extremes of wealth and poverty. And this is a cover from the book that uh, Twain wrote, wrote rather, the Gilded Age, A Tale of Today. The U.S. changed during this period from a predominantly rural agrarian nation to an urban industrial one. Period of great change. Great mansions were the, were the order of the day. Enormous mansions with their staff, you know, maybe dozens of people in order to keep these things going. This is a period on the outside, golden, shiny, beautiful, expanding economy, population growth, extravagant displays of wealth by America's upper class. 
ostentatious wealth, conspicuous consumption. They all built mega mansions, many of which have been maintained through to today and many of which you can tour, uh, depending upon where you are in the country. And we're all fascinated with these mansions. I know in particular, I've uh, been to a, the Biltmore Mansion in uh, Asheville, North Carolina many times because I had a summer place there. Uh, but that was just one example of the many, many mansions that were built. And of course, they were all very uh, showy kinds of constructions. This is Mr. and Mrs. John Rockefeller, including off the train in Cleveland, Ohio. Two different worlds. Notice over on the left, the nice middle class kind of family. Uh, they've got a chess set and they're looking all pretty and clean. And on the right, people who are barely able to survive. The wealthy lived extravagant lifestyles and considered themselves elitists. The common people resented their snobbish attitudes and wealth, and there was a caste system in the United States. In 1861, on the eve of the American Civil War, there were only three millionaires in America out of a population of about 31 and a half million. Of that 31 and a half million, 4 million were African Americans. However, by 1900, there were 3,800 millionaires out of a population of 76 million. And you see how disproportionate it became during this period. 1900, 90% of the wealth was controlled by 10% of the population. Disproportionate. So, I bet you're going to ask yourself or think to yourself, I wonder what it's like today. Well, as of June 2019, the top 10% held 60, approximately 70% of the total US net worth. 10% was 70% of our net worth. That's the value of all assets a person holds minus their liabilities. The top 1% held about half of that wealth. 32.4%, while the next 9% were held approximately, held approximately another half at 37%. So we are disproportionate today, but not quite as disproportionate as during the Gilded Age, but there's still too much of this as far as my own particular opinion. So I will ask any one of you, where do you rank in terms of wealth? Are any of you in that top 10%? or maybe even the top 1%. And some of you may be for all I know. And by the way, if you are in that group, the way you, and you're writing your will, the way you spell my name, make sure you get it right. So it was a, it was a very sad time, hiding the rotten inside. The people, the common person, li people lived very, very terrible, terrible lives. Uh, there was political corruption, scandals, greed, child labor, materialism, racial discrimination, so forth. And the government played very little role in trying to correct any of these problems that did begin to become apparent. Major developments. Establishing the foundation for the 20th century, the period witnessed witness such things as industrialization. Industrialization was only minor before the Civil War. After the Civil War, it exploded. Urbanization, people moved to the cities. Our cities became major, huge, large enterprises or, or places where people lived. Immigration changed things greatly. Um, people moved from other parts of the world, especially they came from Southern and Eastern Europe during this period. So the Gilded Age, noted for industrialization, urbanization, immigration, but also discrimination in the South and West, political corruption on a big scale, and populism. Era's characteristics, strong and rapid growth of industry, mass production, mechanization, and the factory system consolidation of wealth and creation of an American aristocracy. So we didn't naturally have princes and counts and dukes and so forth, but we then really create our own aristocracy. 
political and corporate corruption and laissez-faire hands-off approach to government involvement. Exploitation of cheap immigrant labor. Creation of the American city and the expansion and urbanization of the West. Rapid population growth, both natural and migratory. People, people are having a lot of babies naturally uh, and they were moving around the country and we had people moving from other parts of the world and increased social, racial and labor tension. And there was no referee. There was nobody stepping in to try to fix these inequities that existed. And there were just the hints of things to come. There were beginnings therefore of social, political and labor reform movements. Also, there were movements on the farm to take care of their interests as well before the 19th century ended. Laissez-faire hands off the idea that government should not be involved in business or regulation. And that was the, the standard from the very beginning of this country, that the government should not play any role. It is how capitalism is almost defined. The government doesn't play any role in it. Well, that was fine until we get into this period called the Gilded Age, because by then there were abuses that needed to be corrected. And the only way that those could be corrected is if the government stepped in and it would finally begin to do that. We're having a lot of talk today about the infrastructure, the skeleton of a country referring to transportation, railroads, roads, canals, postal service, tax collection, ability to vote, civil protection, sewage treatment, etc all of those services. Now today there is uh, some bipartisan consensus that we do need a major investment in the infrastructure of America. Uh, the Republicans and the Democrats are going to be arguing about this with the president involved and nobody knows exactly how this is going to turn out bef before it's finally solved. But quite likely there will be some kind of major infrastructure legislation before this year is out. Whether it'll be bipartisan or not is probably the unknown at this point. It was very conscious of, I, I was very conscious when I went to China two years ago of how they have this really superior infrastructure in many ways. Their roads are magnificent. Their railways are, are awesome. Uh, their, their terminals in their airports are absolutely magnificent, uh, far better than what we have in this country. Free enterprise, also sometimes called capitalism, the idea that society benefits from free competition in the market price, yielding individual profit, a better, cheaper product, and a wide availability of goods. Generally a good thing, but it has its problems as well. And then we probably won't get to this today, but we'll talk about political machines, corrupt mafia-like organizations which sold votes for rewards and ran the cities corruptly. Changes in daily life. If you were alive and living in America in the 1860s, your life would have been much different. There would have been no indoor electric lights or outdoor electric lights for that matter. There was no refrigeration other than provided by ice itself. There was no indoor plumbing. There was only kerosene or wood to provide heat. Wood stoves to cook with, horse and buggy. I might add that you could heat also with coal at that point. Uh, in 1860, most mail from the East Coast took 10 days to reach the Midwest and three weeks to get to the West Coast. Things were very slow. A letter from Europe to a person on the frontier could take several months to reach its destination. Pretty slow, very laid back world in the 1860s. By the 1900s, we all of a sudden have had 500,000 patents issued. Most probably important, many of them revolved around electricity. We had refrigerated railroad cars so you could take meat that is butchered in Chicago, for example, or St. Louis or Kansas City, and you could put it in a refrigerated car and you could get it to a destination in the east. That was not possible up till that time. 
We had working sewer systems and sanitation finally. Instead of throwing the sewage out of the window, now we have systems to treat it. We had increased productivity. It made life easier and life was more comfortable. We had power stations which provided electricity for the lamps, the fans, the printing presses, the appliances, the typewriters, you name it. Uh, New York to San Francisco by this time, 10 days using the railroad. Still slow, but much faster than 1860. One and a half million telephones in use all over the country. Now, there still weren't going to be very many telephones for a few years or universal telephones until we probably get to about 1940 and there would be telephones all over the country. Western Union Telegraph was sending thousands of messages daily throughout the country. This was how you got a message quickly from one part of the country to another. You use Western Union. New industries appeared during this time. The oil industry basically did not exist until we get into the Gilded Age. Uh, oil uh, became more and more important. And even during this Gilded Age, it was mostly used for things like kerosene because we did not have automobiles yet. Mining was ex increasingly important as we discovered the wealth that could be extracted from the ground. Sugar producing sugar on a major scale instead of relying on the East or on the Caribbean area for sugar. Steel manufacturing exploded. I'm going to mention more about why that exploded in just a moment. Meat packing, as I talked about how you could now butcher something in Chicago and you could have it on the table in Boston in short order and in good condition. Up until this time, any meat that you cut uh, would spoil if it had to go from Chicago to Boston. Uh, beef and cattle industry exploded. Construction was now on a scale that no one had ever seen before. The telegraph became the vehicle for communication. And of course, at the end of this period, the telephone. The railroad was probably as major as anything in remaking this period. Marketing, the sewing machine made Possible cheaper clothes, more clothing, vacuums, typewriters. The first typewriters appear during this period. Automobile, the automobile just makes its appearance as the period ends. Salt, salt became universally available for everyone. Coal, coal industry uh, expanded and became different as the, as the period passed. And then there were agricultural uh, new industries that developed during this period as well. And here you have a map that shows where these different things are happening in different parts of the United States. Largely the states in the Northeast, states with 25% or more of the employees in manufacturing, this was the old industrial core. Ohio on up through New York and into Massachusetts. Um, but you'll notice down in the south, lots of these oil wells. You'll notice lots of mining for copper and gold and silver in the west. You will notice uh, coal being mined in Illinois and Kentucky and West Virginia. Uh, the thing I find mildly amusing here since I grew up next to it is there's nothing in North Dakota. <laughs> which really wasn't quite true because they had a kind of a coal out there called lignite, but it wasn't major yet at that point. The first transcontinental railroad is finalized during this period, May 10th, 1869 at Promontory, Utah, north of Salt Lake City. The wedding of the rails, the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific come together, but they built it so fast and so shoddily and with so much corruption that within about five years, it had to be totally rebuilt. They used green lumber for the ties and a lot of other things that rotted almost as soon as they were laid down. From agriculture to industry, during the Gilded Age, the United States experienced a rapid shift from an agricultural economy to an industrial one. And now this thing about steel, the Bessemer process, now we have had steel for thousands of years, but steel was very difficult to manufacture and therefore it was confined almost exclusively to weapons. 
to swords and other kinds of uh, devices for killing people. But Mr. Bessemer, in 1856, devises a way of converting iron into steel on a large scale. He's, by the way, this is in the United Kingdom. His invention involved blowing air through the molten iron in a converter or furnace in order to burn off the excess carbon. His invention revolutionized the industrial age almost like nothing else could possibly have done and developed new uses for steel. Was used in railroads, barbed wire, which had never been an industry up until this period, farm machines, which could uh, replace many, many workers, do things much better and more efficiently, and it changed construction, famously the Brooklyn Bridge, but also steel framed skyscrapers now began to appear. These skyscrapers were quite interesting. Uh, they are steel framed. And then basically they hang an external wall on the frame. Um, that's the basic construction. And it's the same thing that's used today. Although of course the system is much more elaborate. With the Bessemer process and Carnegie Steel, skyscrapers revolutionized the building industry. Major city skylines would be dotted with this new type of building as the 1900s began. So key inventions, between 1800 to 1900, the US government issued 500,000 patents and uh, most of those coming after the Civil War. And if you really want to examine, I'll give you a couple of clues. If you wanna know what's going to happen with the future of a nation, uh, you wanna know what's gonna happen with Australia or with uh, Canada, or with the United Kingdom, or with China, or Indonesia, you name it. Take a look at how many patents are being issued in that country, because that's usually an indicator of the future. Uh, it's kind of off topic here a little bit, but another indicator most people don't pay any attention to, if you wanna know what's happening, whether industry is gaining or growing, or the economy is gaining or growing, go to the box manufacturers and find out whether they are making more boxes or they're not because everything needs to go in a box and if they're ordering lots of boxes that means things are going to grow between 1860 to 1900 we have all of these things that come on the scene um, and i'm not going to read the list exactly but dynamite for example and the things that we the levi blue jeans uh, the telephone phonograph the zipper in 1883 imagine a world without zippers uh, the radio in 1895, subway 1897, x-rays. But most interestingly for our purposes, uh, should have one thing come up here and it didn't, sorry, don't know what happened to it, but of most importance on this list, the elevator in 1852 by Mr. Otis. Uh, and his is connected to the skyscrapers. You could not have a skyscraper without an elevator that was safe. And Mr. Otis, perfected an elevator in 1852 that in fact was safe. Some other inventions created during this period, we all know about Coca-Cola, which originally is supposed to have had cocaine in it, streetcars in 1888, the record player in 1877, the skyscraper in 1885, airplane in 1903. The first skyscraper, by the way, was in Chicago uh, in 1885, and it was only 10 stories tall. New stores came about between 1860 to 1900. Specialty stores sold single line of goods. Department stores combined specialty stores. Uh, chain stores for the first time with branches in cities, the same name you could find in different places, and mail order catalogs, which allowed those people out in the middle of Nebraska to have fine goods delivered to them very efficiently. And there were new ways to advertise. And the, then the department stores, of course, then like Montgomery Wards, J.C. Penney, Macy's, Sears, Roebuck, Woolworths, and the list goes on and on, all began to appear and make a difference in how we market. Causes of rapid industrialization, steam revolution of the 1830s to the 1850s. Without this begin preliminary step, none of the other things could have followed. 
the railroad fueled the growing U.S. economy. And of course, the railroads were steam driven, and that was how things moved. First big business in the U.S. was the railroad industry, a magnet for financial investment. And it was a key to opening the West. And it aided the development of other industries. The railroad cannot, cannot overstate the importance of the railroad in the development of this country. Technological innovations, the Bessemer process, and also refrigerated cars, I've mentioned both of those, Edison, uh, the light bulb, phonograph, motion pictures, and many, many, many other things that Edison is responsible for. Causes of rapid industrialization, unskilled and semi-skilled labor in abundance. We had lots of people to draw on. Uh, we had African-Americans who were largely beginning after Reconstruction to leave the South. It's really going to pick up in the 20th century. Uh, we get a rapid movement of Blacks into the cities after that, but there's a lot of it happening. But there were also people leaving the farm because all these farm machines have come along and they're making it uh, so that there, there just isn't labor. I mean, they replace people who are working on the farm. Uh, everything used to be done by hand and now machines were doing it. And then also we had the people who immigrated into this country at this period, mostly from Southern and Eastern Europe, but still from other parts of the country as well, of the world. Uh, abundant capital, there are lots of money to invest. I am kind of beginning to understand that we have a lot of money sitting out there that's going to make our economy grow in the next couple of years. I hope that's right. A uh, new talented group of businessmen or entrepreneurs and advisors. So there are people who are thinking about, hey, how can we use these tools, how, as tools rather? How can, we, how can we suddenly make money? How can we make things grow? And that is the beauty of capitalism. Uh, capitalism actually increases wealth. It increases the, the supply of money, but it takes talented, creative people to do that. Market, we had, a, of course, as our population grows through immigration, high birth rate, uh, that is also a market for all of these products that are being developed, not only here, but around the world. And the United States has been blessed in ways that are almost impossible to describe with abundant natural resources. Uh, oil later on, coal during this period, steel, copper, gold, silver, uh, you name it. Now, one of the things that uh, is beginning to be important are the uh, kinds of products that are needed for producing these batteries that are running our cars. And so, but most of the raw materials for that come from other parts of the world. So now there are people searching the West and have found places where they'll begin to uh, extract the uh, lithium and other kinds of uh, minerals from the earth. And so we'll probably, will catch up in due time there, but we're starting late compared to other parts of the world. But now these problems that we have, and there are many, many problems, uh, they don't go away. Most of the problems generated by the age of energy, in particular, the unequal distribution of wealth, uh, the large scale unemployment, urban crowding, the decline of farm income, and reckless exploitation of natural resources are gonna carry over into the 20th century. And some of those are still with us today. I would submit that it is a problem that we have an unequal distribution of wealth in this country. Uh, I think that all the problems of the cities have not been solved. I think that it is, it, farm income is a very iffy kind of business. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, and I were talking, we grew up in the Red River Valley of Minnesota, and he said that when we were in high school, there were like 30 farmsteads in his township, 30 farmsteads in his township. That meant small farms where people were earning a living, they were living and so forth. Today, there are three. And so this has all changed, and it's uh, what the future holds, I don't exactly know. Captains of industry. 
Entrepreneurs with a talent, vision, and willingness to take risks were able to achieve unprecedented wealth and power. And we have seen that in our current age as well, where there are people who are entrepreneurs. And God bless them because they do make things happen. Uh, but they are also taking a risk. And there are some who fail. There are some who fall on their face and go broke. Titans of business. Uh, private investors and businessmen, they contributed money to elections and campaigns in exchange for a hands-off approach. And so through the latter part of the 19th century, the practice of government is to not do anything. Don't rock the boat. And so we don't really get any intervention just when it is needed. An emphasis on business and making money over reform. So let the people suffer as long as we're making money and we're growing. So who were some of the men? And there were many of them. I could, I could have compiled a list of 100 or 200 or 500 because there were many, many, many. But most notably, we know the names, the titans. There was J.D. Rockefeller from Standard Oil. Still, those people who analyze this say that John D. Rockefeller in his time was, in fact, the richest man in the world or in, probably in the world anyway, at least in the United States. And even compared to today's Gates and so forth, uh, he was still much wealthier, comparatively speaking. We have JP Morgan, the investment and banking financier, who becomes so wealthy that in 1912, when the US economy was on the verge of going upside down, it is his personal money that is loaned to the US government that saves the government. Uh, now that leads them to decide they couldn't continue to do that. And so that leads to then the, the uh, need for a financial uh, regulator. And that's where we have our, uh, our that's what we created in, in 19, uh, hmm, if my amendment straight. Um, 1913, we had two amendments to the Constitution. One changes the election of the Senate and the other one creates the federal, uh, I'm drawing a name blank here on the name of the organization. It'll come to me in a little bit. That does happen to me once in a while. Of course, the man in the upper left is Andrew Carnegie of the Steel Corporation. And Cornelius Vanderbilt, Jay Gould, Jay Fisk, these are the guys who built the massive railroads. The Standard Oil Trust. In 1882, John D. Rockefeller formed the Standard Oil Trust and consequently dominated 95, 95% of the production, refining, and marketing of oil in the United States. If you didn't buy it from John D. Rockefeller, you didn't get it because he was involved in all of it. A uh, very, very wealthy, wealthy man. And this is a famous cartoon of the period uh, based on Ida B. Tarbell's book, The History of Standard Oil, in which it's noted that it's an octopus with it is tentacles into virtually every single aspect of oil extraction and production and delivery. The Federal Reserve is what I meant to say, the creation of the Federal Reserve. Forgive my, my brain fart there. Anyway, we had many, many giant corporations that ruled during this period. By 1900, two thirds of all manufacturing goods were being produced by giant corporations like Swift and Armour and the Duke Tobacco Company. Swift and Armour dominated the meat packing. The Duke family controlled the tobacco. I believe they transfer and become American tobacco in later years. Andrew Carnegie took over every aspect of steel production, every aspect. U.S. Steel Corporation, when he retired in 1901, he sold Carnegie Steel to financier J.P. Morgan for over $400 million. Morgan subsequently reorganized the company into the United States Steel Corporation, and it is still with us and is one of the world's major producers of steel. The rise of big business, trusts. 
a group of separate companies placed under the control of a single managing board. Critics called these practices unfair and the business leaders robber barons. So we have some definitions for a moment here. Philanthropy. Uh, philanthropy is when you give away your money and Andrew Carnegie created libraries all across the country. Many of them still exist. I know there's still one they're preserving in the small town where I was superintendent of schools. Uh, and they were an important, because uh, literacy was something they were putting, trying to provide more of for the public. Laissez-faire, which I've mentioned before, the policy that the U.S. had followed since inception to not allow the government to interfere with business. Captains of industry, positive idea that industrial leaders have worked hard and deserve their wealth. Hey, they did all this work and they created wealth for other people and created jobs for other people. Let them have their their uh, reward. Monopoly, a complete control of a product or service, which is not allowed in our society today. And we have ways of regulating that. And uh, some of you undoubtedly have played the game Monopoly, uh, in which you can pretend to become uh, a, a great uh, dominant force and take over the whole board if you're, if you're wise. Two kinds of ways in which industry was organized, vertical and horizontal. The vertical integration was where you controlled all phases of production from the raw material to the finished product. And Carnegie is an example. He controlled the Coke fields, which he purchased by Carnegie. He controlled, which is you need Coke in order to manufacture the iron or the steel. Uh, the iron ore deposits, most of them in northern Minnesota, but other places as well, also purchased and controlled by Carnegie. He controlled the steel mills uh, purchased by Carnegie. He controlled the ships that, that carried the, uh, the raw material and the final product. Uh, and he controlled the railroads that, in fact, also provided transportation. He controlled it all. On the other hand, there is horizontal integration. And what John D. Rockefeller, he did it one at a time is he bought out all of the possible competition. So they controlled an entire industry. He controlled everything in that. And that's why I said 95% of it, of that whole industry. And that industry was just still, if you compare it to later, was in its infancy because automobiles had not yet appeared, nor had planes that were going to uh, also demand a great amount of gasoline in order to run. The very poor working conditions in the late 1800s. Most factory workers worked 12 hour days, six days a week. Think about that. 12 hour days, six days a week. Steel mills often demanded seven days a week. No vacations, no sick leave, no unemployment compensation or workers' compensation for injuries on the job. And there were many, many injuries. Uh, if you saw films of the textile industry in particular with these ladies working there with their long hair and so forth, it was not unheard of for people to get their hair caught in a machine and have their scalp torn off. Uh, didn't happen every day to everyone, but it happened with some frequency. And you notice these kids working in some of these pictures and uh, uh, children as young as five, as young as five, often worked as much as 12 or sometimes 14 hours a day for as little as 27 cents a day. Now that's child abuse. We know it as child abuse. And is it necessary that somebody's going to have to intervene and change the system? And the answer is yes. And this will be where the government eventually begins to intervene, but it doesn't do it very much in the 19th century, uh, in the Gilded Age. So we also have the very, very beginning of the rise of labor unions. The purpose of a labor union was strength in numbers. Uh, they attempted to gain better working conditions and pay. Uh, here's one important man, uh, his name is Samuel Gompers, American Federation of Labor, the AFL accepted only skilled white males and higher work 
higher wages and shorter work week for its members. Head of the AFL was this man, Samuel Gompers. He originally had been a cigar roller and gradually got into the labor leading business. New immigrants come into America in this period. They're gonna play an increasingly important role. Between 1870 and 1920, 20 million Europeans, mostly from Southern and Eastern Europe came to America. Many of them were Jews or Catholics. Uh, and if I recall correctly, the population of the United States by 1920 was about 120 million. So if we have 20 million new citizens by then, uh, you can see what a large percentage they were of America. Hundreds of thousands came from Mexico, the Caribbean, and China too, though that gets cut off. Looked and sounded different than the natives. Didn't. And the nativism. And so this then emphasizes nativism. This is a movement that begins really when the Irish come in large numbers in the 1840s a movement to ensure that native born Americans receive better treatment than immigrants. Is there nativism today? Yes, there is. And it takes many ugly forms. Uh, matter of fact, if you are watching the voter suppression kinds of things that are happening, it's really a cousin to nativism because you don't want those brown and black people to have the same rights uh, that you do as a white especially male America. A nativist, this is an interesting cartoon, and the irony of it that is shown here is the old immigrants resented the new immigrants, but the new immigrants came to this country for the same reason as the old immigrants. In other words, another generation or two before this, they had been the immigrants knocking on the door. And now because people have become established, they don't want these new uh, dirty people coming in to their life. The new immigrants, uh, 1882, I find this abhorrent. In 1882, there's the Chinese Exclusion Act. It prohibited Chinese laborers from entering the country. It was not lifted until 1943. We exclude Chinese from coming into this country. They were in the West Coast, especially stealing jobs that white people were wanted and so that was part of the motivation and of course they were different we don't like people who are different we want people to be like us so this is an interesting cartoon it shows the happy family middle class family there's mother with the three children and the cat uh, all, all looking clean and nice and neat in their setting on the left you have the uh, opium dem, so to speak, a political cartoon depicting how Chinese immigrants work, lived, uh, and regular American workers lived. And notice the one Chinese person is about to eat a rat. Maybe another one is eating, both of them are eating rats. Anyway, they're just a contrast. It was a, it was a, a racist kind of a, a cartoon, but these were very common during this period. The problems of rapid urbanization, the growth of the cities, Three reasons the cities grew in the late 1800s. New immigrants arriving in the cities for work. And of course, they couldn't go any further than the cities because the, there was no rate, there was no room left in agriculture because they were also leaving uh, and coming into the cities. Uh, farm machines replaced farmers as they moved to the cities. African Americans, though this will increase later on, left the South after the Civil War and came to the Northern cities. Now, they were now free to travel. They didn't need the Underground Railroad to do so. Problems in cities, there were housing shortages, tenement, crowded apartment buildings with poor standards of sanitation, safety, and comfort. Transportation struggled to keep up with the growth. How do you get from where you are sleeping at night to the place where you're going to work? And the question of clean water was difficult to produce and transport. Waste and garbage removal was a challenge and often neglected. And we still struggle with waste and garbage removal in this country. We have it largely under control, but it's still not simple. Fires were very common because a lot of these structures were wood, uh, very poorly built and so forth, and fire uh, 
departments were not as well equipped as they are today. In particular, we have the story of the great Chicago fire in 1871, basically burned a great percentage of the city. San Francisco earthquake in 1906, which again destroyed a significant part of that city. And with urbanization, the other thing that comes as a given is crime roads uh, significantly. So what is a tenement? This is a tenement layout. Now, the one thing I don't know if you can just focus on the center of the picture here, you'll notice that there's a, there's a public hall and then you would get, so you have two bedrooms, a living room and a parlor, uh, and they would all actually have windows. Uh, the bedrooms and the living room would look out on a air shaft, which would have nothing pretty in it at all, except another wall to look at. And there was just down the hallway, a WC, a water closet. That was where you would go to the bathroom. So you had multiple people living in many of these places using one facility. It was not a good situation, very crowded. Here is a picture of a tenement in New York City. Uh, one man who wrote about this, a little Scandinavian by the name of Jacob Rees, he wrote a book called How the Other Half Lived in 1890. Tenement slum living. Here are pictures of tenement slum living. It was terrible. The life expectancy was only in the 40s at this point. That was a, you know, life was very vicious, nasty. Uh, you were not likely to live long. And you huddled in different places uh, and you slept anywhere you could. And here I can't tell how many people are in the bed on the lower left, uh, but there are several people in that bed. Uh, there's a man up, up in the bed, a bunk up above, and two on the right. And it all looks very, very filthy, a disgusting situation to live in. And here we have, I counted this at one point, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people that I can count quickly living in this little tiny alcove. It's very filthy, very nasty. Um, and of course, that's exactly the kind of situation where disease spreads rapidly. Struggling immigrant families, uh, they would often take piecework and they would do some of that at home. Uh, it was uh, not very efficient, but you did what you could do. You put your children to work. And then we have political bosses. This is a famous cartoon by Thomas Nast, the great cartoonist of the late 19th century, uh, who was the one responsible for uh, drawing the first pictures we have that we think of as Santa Claus and so forth. Uh, this is the one of, uh, uh, this is typical of, of, of somebody who is uh, running a, a city and he's got the ballot box right behind him, which he controls. They ran local businesses and politics. They forced the immigrants to vote uh, for specific candidates in exchange for citizenship. And uh, they, they had the power to do this. They said, you know, you vote for my man and I'll get you to be a citizen. They forced the lower classes to pay protection money so that they wouldn't be harmed. Extortion. They stole money from the city coffers through extortion, graft, bribes, private contracts, and misallocation of funds. And you think to yourself, oh, this only happened once. No, it happened many times. Most famous political bosses were in the biggest cities. The most notorious of all was William Boss Tweed of New York City. Here's the famous Tweed Ring uh, by Thomas Nast. And it shows uh, the caption on the bottom was, who stole the people's money? And it was him. And so they're all pointing at somebody else and he has them all labeled as to who is who on this picture. And so they're all blaming someone else. And in fact, they all were participating in taking uh, bribes and other kinds of uh, illegal payments. Uh, Thomas Nast, uh, Tweed gives him credit basically for taking him down. It was the cartoons of Thomas Nast that eventually did it. The political machine, organized group that controls a city's political party. 
they give services to the voters. Now, actually, they did provide services, uh, businesses for political and financial support. After the Civil War, the machines gained control of the major cities. The machine organization, they then worked through precinct captains, ward bosses, and city bosses, and they demanded absolute allegiance to them from the bottom to the top. Boss Tweed was the worst. Uh, he may serve as a mayor, controlling city jobs, business licenses. They influence the courts, the municipal agencies. They arrange building projects, community services. The bosses paid by businesses get the voters' loyalty and extend, extend their influence. Uh, the immigrants, uh, many captains, bosses, the first or second generation of Americans, they were given a job, they were given a responsibility, they were given power, and they'd never had this in the country that they came from. The machines helped the immigrants with naturalization, jobs, and housing, and so then they earned their gratitude in that way. Then came election fraud and graft. They used electoral fraud to make sure that they always won the election. Graft, that was the illegal use of political influence for personal gain. And the machines took kickbacks, bribes to allow local, allow, sorry, to allow legal and illegal activities both, but they were in control. Powerful, powerful people. This is the worst of the boss tweed. Corrupt political leader, he put New York City in debt. 1851, he was elected to the city council. 1852, he served in Congress, kept the Democratic Party in power in New York City and was called Tammany Hall, formed the Tweed Ring, bought votes, encouraged corruption, controlled New York City politics. Nasty man. Received large fees for interests, the kickbacks from the Erie Railroad. The Tweed Ring milked the city with false leases, padded bills, false vouchers, unnecessary repairs, and overpriced goods. Um, this is a re the kickbacks are return of the portion of the money received uh, as, a, as a favor. Exposed for its corruption by cartoonist and editor Thomas Nast. The Tweed Ring fell in 1873. Tweed was convicted of embezzlement. Later, Tweed was arrested on a civil charge and jailed in New York City, where he later died. So.